Welcome to week 12 and our look at women in North America in World War II. Thank you too for posting your questions on the tutorial boards. Remember, if you missed your question last week, you can post it next week, but both tutorial A and B is responsible for a question in week 13. I'm looking forward to reading more of your responses to my seminar questions, and I hope that you're able to keep up with our weekly lessons and readings. Next week, I will also be sending out, or at least attaching under learning materials, your very detailed study guide to help you prepare for your final take-home test. Let's get started. Even the most conservative historians declare World War II a turning point for women. The rise of Nazi Germany began with the election of Adolf Hitler in 1933. Under his leadership, Germany rearmed to pursue a new nationalist foreign policy. And if you want a little more background on that, you can pause this presentation now and take a look at the clip nationalist foreign policy. If you're familiar with World War II, this is a clip you can skip. By 1938, Hitler made moves to expand Germany eastwards, seizing Austria, Czechoslovakia, and eventually Poland. This was the final straw which broke diplomatic treaties, and in 1939, Canada joined Britain and other allied countries in declaring war on Germany. Please write this down. At first, Britain only wanted Canada to supply food and industrial resources. But as Germany advanced, it became apparent Canada would be needed for active duty. At first, Britain only wanted Canada to supply food and industrial resources. But as Germany advanced, it became apparent Canada would be needed for active duty. By the spring of 1940, Canada mobilized for war. This included a massive recruitment campaign to get men to leave their jobs and join the armed forces and for women to leave their homes and enter factories. In 1941, Canada and Britain declared war on Japan, which was allied with Germany. On December 7th of 1941, after the Japanese attack on the American military base Pearl Harbor, the U.S. finally entered the war on the side of the Allied forces. I'd like you to write this down, please. War changes societies internally even for those who never see battlefield action. War changes societies internally, even for those who never see battlefield action. Today, our main concern is to look at the ways in which women's participation in the war effort changed relationships on the home front and women's public status. The experience of working in factories, joining women's divisions of the armed forces, and volunteerism were all a tremendous source of pride for women. Now, as you know, during the Depression, women were lectured on their responsibilities as wives and mothers, and they were advised to avoid paid employment unless it was absolutely necessary. Now, North American governments wanted and needed those same women and their daughters. And they wanted them both to take on wage paying employment. Women discovered that they could take on the same responsibilities as men. This increased their collective self-confidence. While men realized women could rise to the challenge with fortitude. Today, I wanna to look at the question of whether the war was liberating for women. And there are three main things, themes we will explore. Recruitment to factory work, volunteer work, and the armed services, sexuality, and finally, some more propaganda. We must recognize the very question, was war liberating for women, is 
ethnically and geographically specific. I'd like you to write that down. The very question, was war liberating for women, is ethnically and geographically specific. Women living where fighting actually took place, France, Italy, North Africa, Britain, Japan, and Germany, had a very different experience than North American women. And there is no conceivable way that you can argue Jewish women in Germany found the war liberating. Even in North America, we see major differences in the way women experience the war. Most notably, women and men considered enemy aliens suffered a variety of indignities, starting with the suspension of their civil liberties. Canadians of German and Italian origin thought to have fascist sympathies were detained in Canadian prisons or put on probation, meaning they needed to report their whereabouts and activities to a probation officer. A little family history here. My grandmother's cousin, that part of the family is Italian, was detained for teaching the Italian national anthem in her Saturday morning heritage class. Well, at the time, the anthem was fascist because Mussolini was the leader. My grandmother said she may not have been the smartest one in the family, but she was a lovely woman nonetheless. She was held in prison overnight before her family were able to persuade the authorities to let her go. The War Measures Act was first created in 1914 to give the federal government in Canada the power to govern without consulting Parliament and to limit freedoms during the war. With it, during World War II, the federal government interned hundreds of German Canadian men and fingerprinted and photographed thousands of Italian Canadian men. After the raid on Pearl Harbor in 1941, and I would like you to write this down, right by Pearl Harbor raid, all Japanese men, women, and children were considered to be non-loyal citizens, even if born in Canada. All Japanese men, women, and children were considered to be non-loyal citizens, even if born in Canada. Now, historically, there was a long-standing racism against Asian immigrants and workers in Canada. Prime Minister Mackenzie King's Minister of Pensions and Health, whose name was Ian Mackenzie, even promoted the hateful campaign slogan, quote, no Japs from the Rockies to the sea. Dislocation of Japanese Canadians began in 1941 with curfews, followed by the closure of newspapers and schools, then fingerprinting and photographing to create identity cards. In 1942, the government evacuated 22,000 Japanese in British Columbia. I'd like you to write this down. 75% were Canadian-born citizens. 75% were Canadian-born citizens. Those from Vancouver were first taken to the horse stalls in Hastings Park, then transported to camps in the BC interior, where they were forced to farm sugar beets. Families were often separated. Children stayed with their mothers. Men were sent to labor camps, though some families got lucky and were able to stay together. All property was auctioned by the government. And take a look at that picture in the lower left. Japanese fishing boats were sleeker and faster than Canadian fishing boats. Fellow Canadians eagerly snapped them up at auction for a very cheap price. Losses borne by Japanese Canadians totaled almost a billion dollars in today's currency. I would like you to pause this presentation and watch the clip that's called Horse Stalls. <laughs> 
Uh, typically, I would show you this clip until about five minutes and nine seconds. But if you want to watch the entire clip, go right ahead. It is excellent and I think very moving. Demands for internment and resettlement were fueled largely by public hysteria. When war broke out against Japan in December of 1941, anti-Asian rhetoric and racism became patriotic. I'd like you to write this down, please, and I'll repeat it twice. It was irrelevant to politicians that both the RCMP and the Canadian Navy determined Japanese Canadians were not a threat and that whole scale evacuation was unnecessary. It was irrelevant to politicians that both the RCMP and the Canadian Navy determined Japanese Canadians were not a threat and that whole scale evacuation was unnecessary. Senior police and military officials were opposed to resettlement. The camps were cramped, they were often poorly heated, and they offered few recreational amenities or employment opportunities. Movement was monitored by armed guards. The government confiscated all personal property, including homes, land, and those 1,200 fishing boats you saw on an earlier slide, selling them without consent to raise money for the war effort and for internment itself. So imagine being arrested, tried and convicted and paying to be sent to prison for a crime you did not commit. When the war ended, the government encouraged internees to return to Japan. Resettlement plans meant that after the war, those who had been interned could choose to go east of the Rockies or be deported back to Japan. Approximately 4,000 people, some who had never been to Japan before and who did not speak the language, were deported. I'd like you to write this down, please. Full citizenship and the right to vote were not granted to Japanese Canadians until 1949. Full citizenship and the right to vote were not granted to Japanese Canadians until 1949. It was not until 1988 that Prime Minister Brian Mulroney made an official apology and attempted restitution for detainees or their descendants for the loss of property. Please pause this presentation and be sure to watch the clip of the apology. If you have time, I also recommend this longer clip called Minoru Memory of Exile. It is a beautiful and poignant NFB animation of one family's response. For those women deemed good patriotic citizens, the government undertook a massive mobilization campaign. I would like you to now pause this presentation and watch the clip called Good Patriotic Citizens. Please take notes on Ronnie, the Bren Gun Girl from 1941. I'm just saying it may show up on your last test. As working women left the service sector to join more lucrative war industries, the government was faced with a labor shortage in clerical work, administration, and support staff. So the government widened its net by promoting the advantages of part-time work to married homemakers who were accommodated in numerous ways by employers. For instance, the establishment of public daycare facilities was the most important new social policy in this era. But other steps were taken to facilitate women's entry into the labor force, like the establishment of housewife shifts. Please write down this definition of housewife shifts. Women would be hired to work short shifts 
from 7 to 11 p.m. after the kids were in bed. Women would be hired to work short shifts from 7 to 11 p.m. after the kids were in bed. Women's everyday routine domestic labor was recognized as socially necessary, and once again, volunteer work was seen as an extension of womenly duties. It was also considered important enough to be controlled by the federal government, which created the Women's Voluntary Services Division in 1941. They recycled goods for use in munitions and war materials, and the, uh, the rationing of consumer products was also legislated. Volunteers distributed ration books for sugar, coffee, tea, butter, meat, and gasoline. Hoarding could be fined, so women were expected to monitor their communities. The division organized blood drives for the Red Cross. They also raised money for soldiers' families. They knit warm clothes for soldiers. They planted victory gardens to keep families well supplied with fresh produce. Victory gardens are just you being asked to create a vegetable garden on any square space of land, and we'll see that more in the next slide. Women were also told to organize parcels that could be shipped to soldiers on the front lines. Their services were critical to the war effort. Please write this down. By getting women to do these jobs, the government received valuable labor for free. By getting women to do these jobs, the government received valuable labor for free. There was enormous female participation at the grassroots of voluntary activities. But there was very little female representation in centers of power. The massive government bureaucracy established in Canada to deal with the war, well, it contained very few women. So here on the left, we have a photo in Toronto of a victory garden. This is a fairly large plot of land and it almost looks like it's an allotment where people would go to help work on the land and then they would each be responsible for a smaller rectangular plot. On the right, we see the poster, we're in the army now, your aid is vital. And it's telling women especially how they can collect materials that can then be either uh, melted down or repurposed in some way for the war effort. So you see all of the women who are very fashionably dressed and in the much shorter skirts because of course rationing of cloth is also happening at this time. So now you see skirts up by the knee. They're all just laden with items that they are going to recycle. Even the dog is bringing a bone for the war effort. Okay, I will admit this is a British recruitment poster, but how could I not add it into the slideshow? I mean, look, the housewife is literally slapping Hitler. And it was uh, shown across Canada as well. In wartime, everything from buying government bonds to gardening to working in hospitals was seen as a patriotic imperative. While there is no doubt many women had strong patriotic feelings when they decided to answer the call to service, some may have had other motives for taking on war work. In fact, the majority did it for the money. The pay was better. This motive is completely understandable when you realize work in war industries paid much better than traditional women's jobs. In a survey undertaken in the early 1940s, women were asked why they were working. 59% answered that they were working to support the family home and the family income. In other words, they had a responsibility to take care of someone else. 32% said they were working for personal need. 
and only 9% said they were working for patriotic reasons.